so welcome back to the second part of the lecture, which should be an introduction to spatial audio. Um, as yesterday, I don't see it as a talk. It should be more kind of lecture, workshop. So please stop me. Feel free to ask questions, get into discussions, because that's why we are here. <clears throat> so yesterday, we talked a little bit about spatial audio. We've been listening to some very early pieces in spatial audio, like Stockhausen's Kontakte and other pieces. Um, and so we ended up um, getting some insight into wave feed synthesis. And today, I would like to talk a little bit about higher order ambisonics, which is the second big, well-established, well-used system in 3D audio. Uh, nowadays. So the aim of high order ambisonics is the same than the aim of wave feed synthesis. We would like to uh, reproduce the sound field in a physical sense, so physically correct, into the room. So we use an ensemble of speakers, an array of speakers, um, into the, to reproduce the sound field. So yesterday I showed you this picture. Um, we know from theory that if you want to like, like to have wave feed synthesis with height reproduction, we would have to put speaker arrays on top of speaker arrays. And if you look at this little photoshopped picture there, um, you would need very many speakers to apply the standard straightforward wave feed synthesis approach to a surrounding speaker array. You can rethink wave feed synthesis. I'm not saying that wave feed synthesis is not working with a surrounding speaker array. Um, but if you want to use it as a sound field reproduction technology, then you need very many speakers, which is actually the same for ambisonics. So you could also reformulate wave feed synthesis um, into a surrounding sparse array approach, which has been done by many companies because it's a rather tricky to sell hundreds of speakers in line array configurations, uh, which is called sparse wave feed synthesis which brings us away from sound field reproduction. It's more advanced panning, I would say, than sound field reproduction. Anyway, ambisonics, the main idea of ambisonics, which was developed by Michael Gerson in, in the 70s, um, was to solve the wave equation, but with some constraints to get it better adapted to a surrounding speaker array by putting all speakers on a sphere surrounding the audience. Mm -hmm. So actually, ambisonics is nothing else like a Fourier transform on the surface of a sphere. Um, sounds, it's not that tricky, sounds easier than it is, um, but it's also not very tricky. So when you think about a Fourier transform, what's all about? What are you doing when you transform a signal into frequency domain applying Fourier transform? No? Yes? Oh, yeah. You decompose it into a sum of sinusoidal waves, which are yeah. regular and of different amplitude and phase and frequency. You just compare it to sinusoidal waves. You see how well it is correlated. And when your signal is well correlated to a sinusoidal wave, then your frequency bin will get a high amplitude. Then you take the next frequency and the next and the next. So here we are not applying. So this is time frequency processing. So we are here we are applying the Fourier transform from space to the domain which you call spatial frequency domain. So what does this mean? Just um, so the, the sinusoidal functions in a Fourier transform are normally referred to as kernel of the transform. Okay, just call, call it kernel. So what happens in space? Um, let's think about an omnidirection microphone here, and you want to capture the sound field. So it takes sound from coming from all directions. If I walk around the microphone array and I look at the weighting function of the microphone, it's always one because there's no weighting um, on the different directions. So if I think about a time signal, which is always one, that's zero frequency, okay? Here, if I walk around my sphere in all directions, and it's always one, it's omnidirectional, so it's my zero spatial frequency. So what is our first frequency in, in, in the Fourier transform? It's one signal, one period in 2p, 2 pi. 
So, if I walk around my microphone and it's one here, it goes to zero, it goes to minus one, it goes to zero and goes back again to one, we get a dipole. So figure of eight. Dipole is a figure of eight with positive and negative lobe. Second frequency in Fourier transform is two periods in two pi. Okay, one, zero, minus one, zero, one, zero, minus one, zero. So I walk around this function here and I get a quadrupole. And then I get multipoles. We don't call them by name anymore afterwards. <laughs> that's getting too tricky. So that's the functions you can see here. The problem is we are working with operating in three dimensional space. So it's not enough to have one function, one dipole in x. So you needed the x, y, z. And then with the quadrupoles, it's getting a little bit more tricky. But what we do is we apply a Fourier transform on the surface of a sphere using or replacing the sinusoidal functions by spatial functions, which are nothing else than the fundamental frequencies which we use for Fourier transform in space. So that's a little mathematical description. But it's important for you to understand that the first frequency of ambisonics is omnidirectional, spatial frequency. So if you use the first channel of an ambisonic signal, you have no information on space. You don't know where the sound wave is coming from. It's just the sound pressure at the point of the microphone. What happens if you sum up a cardio... Uh, hello. Mm. What happens if you sum up a dipole and a monopole? Cardioid. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, with those functions here, so if you sum up the omnidirectional and the dipoles, you get a steerable cardioid which you can steer to all directions. So first order ambisonics has a spatial resolution of a cardioid. If you add the next frequency, then you get a supercardioid and it gets narrower and narrower and narrower. So the more of those functions you're adding, the more frequency you're adding, the more accurate in space you get. So, which means the higher the ambisonics order, the more accurate is a representation of a point source in space. So when we talk about the point source um, and reducing, for example, the order of ambisonics, reducing the order means increasing the localization blur. It gets blurry, it gets blurred up. So for those of you who are old enough, like me, and still been working with 25K modems or less, downloading a JPEG picture or a picture was getting low resolution. The more information you could get, the more refined the resolution was. It's the same with ambisonics orders. Lower the signal, you still have the spatial distribution of sound sources, but not very accurate. It's a blurry image, um, and a blurry auditory image. Which means, when you have a complex sound scene, hundreds of sources are flying around, um, and let's say you've been producing ninth order ambisonics, you get a 100 channel ambisonic sound file, you come in here, you have 32 speakers, which allows you to play back fourth order ambisonics, you can still play the same sound file back, but with lower resolution. So which is a nice advantage of ambisonics if you do a high order uh, production, you can always go lower. You, cannot, you can go higher as well, but you don't gain any advantage of playing over ninth order system, a fourth order signal. It's still, there's not more information. It's like a bandpass filtered, audio signal played back of a high fidelity speakers, it's still a bandpass filtered audio signal. So we do the same in space. Okay, um, for those of you, uh, of you um, who are a little bit more into signal processing and mathematics and whatever, I, I just go quickly over this because there, there's one interesting aspect which is interesting for all of you um, also as a composer. So like with wave field synthesis, if you want to reproduce the wave field, we say, we have to solve the wave equation. So that's the little equation which is somewhere written here. So blah, blah, blah. We can solve this um, by a constraint on the sphere. So we are using spherical coordinates. By using spherical coordinates, we get the homogeneous solution of the Helmholtz equation, blah, blah, blah. And the normal mathematical function, so ansatz function, is variable separation. So you try to split up your problems, which is in 
space, so azimuth, elevation, distance, and time. So you have four parameters which describe space and time. And you try to split up your differential equations into four equations which only depend on time, on distance, on azimuth, and elevation angle. So that's written here. You, you don't have to solve it. There's a, there are great books. A lot of mathematicians have done this for us. OK, so we get, and that's also something you can look up in formula books or whatever. So as a solution, we get what's the spherical Bessel function, which will become important when you want to really want to understand ambisonics, not the derivation. That's not important. You just need to know some terms, even as a composer. Um, so you, get, you split it up in a function which only depends on the radius, so the distance from the center of the sphere, which is the spherical Bessel function. You get a linear differential equation which only depends on azimuth, so the angle in horizontal plane, and elevation, the angle from the zenith down to the horizontal plane. Luckily, that standard differential equations, which has been, so the spherical Bessel differential equation was solved for us by Bessel, the linear differential equations, it's easy to solve first lecture mathematics at the university. And the Le Chandre differential equation was solved by Le Chandre. So we don't have to care. Um, so we find the solutions for those equations, which brings up to these functions here, which is all the functions which solve in a spherical domain, in a spherical coordinate system, our uh, wave equation. And now, so you see I have four functions here, which are the solutions for the distance-dependent wave propagation. And now, it only depends on what we call boundary conditions, which functions I use. Boundary conditions is nothing else. Do my sources lie outside my sphere or inside the sphere? Outside the sphere would be I record with a spherical microphone array, all the sources are outside the spherical microphone array, and afterwards I reproduce it over a dome of speakers inside the volume. This would be a boundary condition, all sources outside. If I use a spherical loudspeaker array, I'm playing outwards. So all my sources are more or less inside the sphere of speakers, and I'm playing outwards. So I get other solutions here. So the distance-depending solutions um, are those four here, and then we get the angle-dependent, angular solutions, um, which are very standard functions. So we combine the angular functions, and those functions are called spherical harmonics, or spherical surface spherical harmonics. So those spherical harmonics, we've seen them before. So this was my explanation of what we are doing. We apply a spherical, uh, so we apply a Fourier transform on the surface of a sphere, by applying those functions. And it's not a surprise that if I do it mathematically and I solve my wave equation into the spherical domain, I get exactly those functions. So it was just a little explanation for all of you who want to deal um, in a more mathematical sense. So it's important to know because actually projecting the sound field on this function here, the omnidirectional, gives me the audio stream of my first channel in ambisonics. The second frequency is defined by three functions here. So I need three additional more channels to have a first order ambisonic signal. So all of those who have been working with a B format microphone, or A format microphone, so the sound field microphone, you get four channels of this microphone. It's called W, X, Y, Z, no, X, Y, Z. So that's the four channels of a sound field microphone. If we go higher, we'll get a talk tomorrow by um, Jens Meyer from, from MH Acoustics, who built this very beautiful uh, eigen mic, which goes up to fourth order. So fourth order means I have to add another bunch of functions here, which adds me four addition, uh, five additional channels. So a second order signal consists of all those channels. A fourth order signal, a third order, so zero, one, two, three, adds another seven channels. So if you want to increase the order of ambisonics, it's a quadratic function. 
So if your order equals n, you need n plus 1 squared functions. So if my order is 1 here, n plus 1, so 2 squared is 4 channels. If I have a second order signal, it's 3, so 2 plus 1 equals 3 squared, it's 9 channels. And so that's something you have to know if you want to produce in ninth order ambisonics. You need 9 plus 1, 10 squared, 100 channels. So your ambisonic signal will have 100 channels. It's a multi-channel file with 100 channels. The other thing you have to know about ambisonics is, now imagine that you're ordering, so you put your projected channels into a sound file, a multi-channel sound file. So I may want to put it in a way that I say, this is my first channel, this is my second, this is my third, and this is my fourth channel. Somebody else will maybe put them in there, this channel first, second, third, fourth. So if you do not know there are different conventions on how to order, how to arrange the channels in an ambisonics file, if you have no information about the ordering of channels, you cannot play back the ambisonics file. So it's up to you when you produce an ambisonics to give all the side information. The best would be to put it in the XML header in the multi-channel file because then it's always there. So it's the ordering of the channels which is important. So one of the standard orders is just going through like this, uh, through this triangle. So that's a very important aspect. A second aspect is this little function here. So it's a normalization function. Um, if you think about a Cartesian coordinate system, so when you project a function or a point, you want to represent the point in the Cartesian coordinates, you have x, y, z. It works because it's they're orthogonal or orthonormal. So they have the, you have vectors which are one. So if I change the x-axis, it doesn't influence the y and the c. So we have to make sure that those functions here are orthonormal functions. Because otherwise, if I change, it's the same for the uh, Fourier transform. If I would change frequency bin 2, it would have an influence over the, all, all the other uh, frequency bins. So it works because those functions we are using, the sinusoidal signals, are autonormal. They do not influence each other. It's the same in space. They shouldn't influence each other. So unfortunately, we need some kind of scaling that this is true. Many different domains are using ambisonics from physics over geodesy over whatever, and also acoustics. And unfortunately, we do not use the same conventions. Um, so make sure. We have, in acoustics, we use the normalized or the Schmidt semi-normalized functions. If you use a tool for encoding ambisonics, make sure that you know which normalization is applied. Because otherwise, it will not be played back correctly by the decoder. So the second information, so first information, the number of channels depends on the order of the ambisonic signal. Second information, you have to know how to arrange your channels, at least which convention is applied by your plugin for encoding ambisonics. And the third one is, you should know which normalization function has been used um, when encoding ambisonics. Because ambisonics is not standardized. It's not a standardized format. Um, so we have standard conventions, recommendations, but there is not only one ambisonics format. Okay. 3D and the SN 3D? Yeah, it's 3D and SN 3D. And there's more than that? Or uh, you have, when you use B format, you use first Melham. Okay. It's another one. And then we have the, uh, I'll late, let you later on. Um, so there, then there would be in, in, in uh, quantum physics, they use a little minus one uh, exponential n function here, which is called the Compton shortly phase which allows you to express the spin of molecules, uh, which are sometimes used as well in acoustics and sometimes not. So um, in other words, it's a big mess. So what we did, we tried to standardize it when we created the Ambisonic Symposium back in 2009. We failed. Too many different interest groups. And I then just stepped out of the standardization. I did too much standardization in my life. And, there are many, many things when you, how to waste time in your life, and one is standardization. Um, 
at least when you fail. And so what we, for example, do in SPAT, we provide little objects which convert everything to everything. So if we cannot agree, we need little helper tools which help us to convert from one convention to another. Um, it's easier to develop this than to go into standardization meetings. Um, anyway, I just wanted, to, you don't have to remember the mathematics and whatever. Um, so you just have to remember the important information you have to send with your ambisonics file or at least store in the text file with your ambisonics file that somebody else can reproduce the ambisonics file without knowing what you've been doing. So Jens will talk tomorrow about um, the microphone array. So ambisonics, the original ambisonics approach was using plane waves, a plane wave decomposition, which means there's no distance information. So we solve the wave equation under the constraint that we have the sound source coming from a certain direction as a plane wave. So we do not encode distance. If you do a full spherical wave spectrum, you also account for the distance, and the distance functions are the spherical Bessel functions. So when you record or when you create an ambisonics microphone array, you have to know the radius of your sphere to know where your um, capsules are. And the problem with this radius on the sphere is that this Bessel function has zeros. And unfortunately, when you encode, you have to divide by the Bessel function, and you divide by a zero, so you get strong resonances. We'll come to this a little bit later on. So that's the distance-dependent functions here, which are the spherical Bessel functions, or when you want to build a loudspeaker array, then it's the spherical Hankel function. Anyway, so that's the annoying functions we get here. Um, so that would be the frequency range expressed as the wave function times the radius anyway. So this would be frequency here. And you see, you limit it by the orders. So higher orders produce a strong gain here at lower frequencies. And all orders produce a lot of resonances at higher frequencies. Fortunately, when you use an, a closed sphere, so a sound hard sphere, you can get rid at least of many of those resonances here, but you still, and that's another thing you have to know, you have this strong amplification, so this bass boost for higher orders in low frequencies. So when you encode an ambisonic signal, so let's say you make an eigenmic recording, um, it's a fourth order ambisonics microphone array, you get your 32 capsules recording, so 32 channel recording, and you find a plugin which allows you to encode this function. Normally, this plugin provides, if it's well done, something which is called soft limiting. Soft limiting means in the low frequency, you limit those functions to, let's say, 20 dB, 30 dB, 40 dB, whatever. Because otherwise, you would put high dynamics. So if you have noise in low frequencies, you get a very high amplitude in this noise for higher orders in low frequencies. So if you encode an ambisonic signal and you have low frequency noise and it gets very boosted in, ampli uh, in amplitude, then you have to apply this soft limiting function and say, hey, uh, okay, I get a little distortion of my sound field in bass frequencies, but it's better than having high amplified, uh, highly amplified noise. So that's due to these Bessel functions we have to use because it's the solution of our wave equation. You have to take care by yourself about limiting this boost. So, in other words, when you get a plugin, you use a plugin for encoding your eigenmic recordings or your higher order ambisonics microphone uh, recordings. Then, normally, if it's well done, the plugin it should provide this, uh, which is normally referred to as soft limiting, a soft limiting function which allows you to uh, limit the bass boost for higher orders in low frequencies. That's very, very important when you work um, with uh, higher order recordings. So here in ambisonics, I was saying the original approach is using plane waves. In other words, I want to reproduce. Oh, we can't see it. So this is the plane wave coming from a certain direction, which I can express as a function on the sphere in spherical harmonics. Now, I say I have a surrounding speaker array, and every speaker is also represented as a plane wave. So which normally would say I'm far enough from the speaker um, that I can say it's a plane wave. But anyway, it's an approximation. And now you say, and that's the matching conditions, so it's the, 
the standard ambisonics um, decoder as has been proposed by uh, Michael Gerson, you take the contributions of all those speakers here to recreate the original sound wave. So you say, okay, I take the spheric harmonics decomposition of my original sound wave. I take all the sum of the spherical harmonics decomposition of the contributions of my loudspeakers in the system. And for each spatial frequency, they have to match. So it's a little bit like um, um, frequency synthesis, so synthesizing with frequency bins. So you have three synthesizers, <laughs> and you say you add them up for different frequencies, and you recreate the original spectrum. Here, you recreate the original spherical spectrum by summing up the contribution of all loudspeakers. So, oh. Even with beautiful colors. Um, OK. So in terms of mathematics, we express this as a matrix system. So here is the sound pressure at the position. So it's for each frequency band normally. Um, the sound pressure at the position of loudspeaker 1. The sound pressure at the position of loudspeaker 2, and so on. Those coefficients here is the ambisonics representation of my original wavefront. And here, it's the spherical harmonics coefficients of the first spherical harmonics, so the omnidirectional, so this would be all one, evaluated at direction one, so for loudspeaker one. So this function here is one because it's omnidirectional. The next one would be the first spherical harmonics, the dipole, evaluated at direction for loudspeaker one. So let's say I have the dipole which goes in this direction here. Um, so my microphone is here. So the speaker here will be at the zero of the dipole. So those coefficient here, this coefficient here will be zero. If there is a loudspeaker or not, I can't see, but here is one. So that one would be at the main lobe of my dipole. So this coefficient for this loudspeaker here will be one. And so you're summing up order by order all the contributions. So for decoding ambisonics, it's the inverse thing. You want to compute the sound pressure which has to be played back by each loudspeaker. And what you have is the ambisonics representation for your sound field coming from a certain direction. The problem is you have to divide by this matrix here for those who are in Mathematics, I say it correctly, you have to left multiply by the inverse matrix. So inversion of a matrix is limited to the conditioning of the matrix. For those who are not deep in the mathematics, conditioning of the mat mat matrix um, only says how close can the matrix become or get to zero, how high is the dynamics. So if this matrix here is not very well conditioned and you want to inverse the matrix, you divide by something which is close to zero, which means for this condition, you get a very high boost. In audio, a very high boost means you get a zero dB burst over all speakers in your room. And having hundreds of loudspeakers in your room, believe me, it's not very comfortable. So <laughs> it's really not comfortable. Um, so now we have to ask ourselves the question, what makes this matrix not very well conditioned, because we have to deal with this problem. And we can show very easily, so this matrix, the encode or decoding matrix then, only depends on the position of my loudspeakers. So as long as my loudspeakers are regularly distributed on a sphere, I get a well conditioned system. So now it's a huge mathematical question what means a regular distribution on a sphere. But that's another story. Um, anyway, as long as you have sufficiently enough loudspeakers for your ambisonics order, and they are somehow well arranged on a sphere surrounding the audience, you shouldn't have any problems. Um, before normally switching on a system with ambisonics, you compute the condition number of your matrix. And if the condition number, let's say, exceeds 50 dB, you shouldn't switch on. Because you may find a source position somewhere which just amplifies to zero dB. Um, 
just, he, just to get this right, because this is very often done wrong. And um, first of all, never use ambisonics without a mixing desk or a, a kill switch. Or anyway, you should never ever do computer music without a kill, kill switch in between you and the speakers. Um, especially when you use very many speakers. Just imagine a 0 dB burst, which comes from all speakers, which are superimposed in one position. It's normally your preferred position, <laughs> uh, in phase. So like in our concert hall, I have 350 speakers times 250 watts. It's not only that it hurts, uh, you may damage your ears. And that's not worth the, the, the exercise. So what we have is, we have a little kill switch here, because if you have even loud signal, if you're exposed to a very loud signal, so I'm not cool enough to sit there in front of my max patch and say, hey, OK, what's going wrong? Uh, maybe I better switch off now my DSP and see what's going wrong. No, you just panic. <coughs> um, it's nice if you ever had in dark with flashlight sound installations, which give you to a very highly high noise, exposed noise, you panic in there. It's just your, your neurons go wild. And I don't know, maybe some people are well-trained and go in there and say, hey, it's cool. Um, but it's difficult. So get a kill switch, because the problem with mixing desks is when you do high-density loudspeaker arrays, we do not yet have mixing desks which allow us to have a mute button for hundreds of channels. So what I normally do is a kill switch, which kills the amps. So electricity off, power off the amps. So you're on the safe side. When you do sound insulation art, I feel like a little preacher, um, but when you do sound insulation art, you are in charge of the people. So if unsupervised, I hang microphones which, um, which measure permanently the sound pressure in the room. And if you exceed a certain sound pressure, you dim it. And if you exceed the peak pressure, you kill it. Um, that's very important, especially when you use an active systems with microphones in the rooms, you know, feedback and all these things, which is fun. Um, but take care uh, when, work, when working with those systems to, to have something which protects you and uh, the audience. Okay, so we now know a lot of things about ambisonics. So we need at least as many speakers as amb ambisonics channels. If I want to play back a ninth order ambisonics, file, I need at least 100 speakers surrounding the audience. The speakers should be as regularly distributed in space as possible, normally on its full sphere. And if all those conditions are well done, I check my matrix, and if it's less than 50 dB condition number, I can switch on and it's fun. If it's not the case, I cannot use the so-called mode matching decoder. I have to go to a decoder which takes care about this badly conditioned situation I'm in. And since we are traveling a lot with ambisonic systems and whatever, we had to deal with this problem mathematically. Um, because you know, in concert halls, you never ever get your preferred speaker positions. So we created together with Franz Sutter um, a decoder which is called energy preserving. This decoder is always stable. It never gets unstable. In ideal conditions, it might not sound as nice as a mode matching, but you, since we are never in ideal conditions, um, I don't care. Um, so the choice of your decoder might change slightly the timber of what you're playing back, but it also defines if your playback decoder is stable or not in maybe not optimal conditions. Yes? So generally, does a decoder perform, is a decoder a mapping from whatever deformed sphere you have in practice and the canonical sphere using some measure? Like, and also specifically with the energy preserving decoder? Um, no, actually you always, everything works on the sphere and it's up to you to take care if you work in a rectangular room. What you do normally, you equalize a system to take care about the different distances of loudspeakers so you virtually project them on the sphere. With vessel functions? No. Just do it straightforward. You don't need the Bessel function. This would be an overkill to say. You can formulate ambisonics by using point sources for each speaker and point sources as well. But it's not worth the effort. So what you do is normally, it's very easy to compute the gain uh, which you lose for a loudspeaker being far away. And then you compensate for the phase. Or the sound engineering approach 
put a microphone in the sweet spot, measure all speakers, time align them, and uh, gain align them. So, sorry, then just about the energy preserving uh, as an example. The energy preserving as an example, um, so there are a very, t very many textbooks on how to deal with a badly conditioned system, so matrix and mathematics. So what we, the term we are using is called regularization. So you can apply different regularization functions which behave differently. So energy preserving is just regularizing the main diagonal of this function. Is this like a harmonic map? No, it's not a harmonic map. It's more, how to say? So the easiest form of regularization would be, so what defines the condition number? It's the smallest and the highest eigenvalue of a matrix. So you can order the eigenvalues from low to high, and then you just say, I throw away after, so the eigenvalues which exceed 20 dBs. So okay. this is called, um, so you do it with singular value decomposition. This means you get your eigenvalues and then you order them. And throwing away means truncated singular value decomposition. So this would be one form of regularizing the system. But, and, and, and then you preserve the energy in the sense that you scale the rest of the eigenvalues that you keep? Yeah. Okay. You preserve the energy. So when we've been thinking about this ambisonics approach, which is energy preserving, we said, OK, what do we want to have when we work with trajectories? There should be no energy fluctuation when a pan a sound source around. So I give up the holophonic approach saying I reproduce the sound field by getting a very smooth panning. And then you can say, OK, if I'm in ideal conditions, I use mode matching. I'm more into the, the sound field reproduction approach. But if I work with a big auditorium and in a big auditorium, then I'm normally pan ambisonic. So I use a kind of ambisonics panel, um, which is far from sound field reproduction. But we know that sound field reproduction doesn't work because we have a sweet spot. OK, so lots of information on ambisonics and some colored pictures are always nice. Uh, we'll listen to some music as well. OK, so this would be a point source here in this position. This would be a plane wave coming from that position. So that's the First, uh, so the zero order representation of the sound field, which means no information on this uh, on, on direction. First order, as we've learned, cardio is a resolution. So I know, oh, the sound wave comes from this direction in the form of cardio. Same for the plane wave. Next order, order three, so it's a super cardioid. And the higher you get in the order, you see here the sweet area, you start to reproduce the plane wave or uh, the 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 wave of the point source here in the sweet area. So I go to order 10. You see, OK, ah, for this frequency here, I start reproducing the wave quite properly in the room. And then order 20, I guess. So that's a very nice reproduction already. But we know order 20 in 3D means, OK, let's say order 19, it's easier. So it would be 20 squared, so 400 speakers, 400 channels you have to distribute. And the problem is this function here, which just only says the frequency, which is in k, the distance from the center should be less, so um, the, the wave number times the distance from the center should be less than the order. In other words, if you want to create a bubble of perfect sound field reproduction around your head in the center of a well-equalized sphere with 20 centimeter distance of your ears, you need to go up to order 30 of ambisonics, so you need 900 speakers around you to get this done up to 16 kilohertz. So yes, holophony is great. So sound field reproduction in physical sense, but you not very often working conditions, I guess, where you have 900 speakers surrounding you and you get the perfect sweet spot for one person. But again, um, in Human auditory perception is something nice because we, we create our mind map um, that the world around us is as stable as possible, which is great in this sense because you can see with many listening experiments, as long as you have order four or five of ambisonics, you get a very good localization of sound sources. So 25 speakers is already okay for reproducing ambisonics. We are far from holophony. We are not reproducing a sound field that you can go there and measure it with microphone arrays and whatever. 
But we get a stable localization in the room, and actually, when you work with trajectory, that's what you want to do. You want to get a stable localization when panning a sound source around. So another thing you should remember, you should work at least with order three, four. I would say four would be better. That's 25 channels. That's OK. 25 channels is something you can get in every concert hall. You can travel with 25 channels. So 25 channels nowadays is not a big deal um, normally. Also, renting 25 channels, it's OK. So that's a lot of information you have to know about ambisonics. So before we come to the first example, um, yesterday I've been saying that wave field synthesis, there is no associated recording technology. Ambisonics, OK, we measure, we reproduce the sound field on a sphere, so we measure it on a sphere. So we get a spherical microphone array, like the sound field microphone array, like the eigen mic or higher order. So there are some properties of ambisonics which are really nice. The one is that encoding is independent of decoding. It's not like 5.1, where you have your tree of microphones, five microphones, like your OCT tree. And it works because you know the playback situation is normalized. So you should have a speaker at 0, minus 30, 30, and 110, and minus 110 degrees. If you do not match these conditions, it's your problem. Because we agreed that I give you a file which works with this condition. Ambisonics doesn't know anything about your speaker setup. When you encode ambisonics, the only thing you have to know is the maximum order which you want to play back the signal. So if I come, again, with a ninth order ambisonics file here, I get the coordinates of the speakers in this room. And OK, it's 32 speakers. So we know now 32 speakers would be order 4, 4 plus 1 squared, 25 channels. I feed my speakers' uh, positions into my decoder and can play back in this room. If I then go to the concert hall next door, where we have a 64-speaker array, OK, I can play up to seven, order 7. So that's quite nice about ambisonics. So you always can play back. So you, I also can play back a first order signal in here. I just do not have any more information. It's blurred as the first order signal is blurred, but OK. And the only condition I have to match is I always have to use as, uh, at least as many channels of playback as I have ambisonics channels. Otherwise, I have to reduce the order. So if you plan a speaker rig and you say, OK, um, should I use six, uh, 36 or 35 speakers, it would be stupid using 35. Because then you have to go back by one order. 36 would be order fifth of ambisonics. 35, ah, you failed by one, one order back, so it's only 25. Uh, order four. So just think when you work with ambisonics, so 16, 25, 36, and so on. That's the numbers you have to remember. So it's better to add one speaker somewhere, which allows you to decode the next order of the signal if you have enough orders in the signal, enough spatial resolution, because you gain spatial resolution, you gain information. Otherwise, you lose a whole bunch of, of information. The other thing which is nice about ambisonics, it's all defined on a sphere, so it's easy to rotate. Now imagine um, you work in VR. You get headphones. We'll talk about binaural in, on, on Friday, but there's one approach which is called virtual speakers. So if you ever heard about head-related transfer functions, it's just the measured function for my ear for the different direction in space. So I can encode my speakers with these functions. If I now, let's say I synthesize a sound source here, I encode into binaural. If I turn my head left with a head tracker, and in the same time I turn my sound field to the right with the same speed, my sound source is stable in the room. So I can turn my head around. And this is very important for human auditory perception. So this gets you gain a lot of out-of-the-head localization. You gain about um, localization accuracy. So that's a very important fact. And so easy. It's a very simple matrix. So it doesn't cost a lot of CPU. And in ambisonics, since everything is on a sphere, it's perfect for binaural reproduction. So that's really nice uh, working with ambisonics. Okay, just a quick question. Yes. Um, so if you have a, um, so if you have a folder full of sound files and 
some of them were made with a core sound and some of the with a touch mic. Some hmm? were made with an ambio and some were made with a sound field. They're all the same number of capsules in the A format and format transfer should be fine. Is there a noticeable difference? I've not tried this myself, but I just thought of the question while you're doing this. Um, between the capsule dimensions of the three different mics? I mean, I know physically they're different. But is there a reproduction difference in the capsule dimension? No, the reproduction that? difference, there's no reproduction difference because they should be coincident, yeah. actually. Yeah. Um, it's just the sound quality of the microphone itself. Yeah, yeah. There you get a huge difference is, for example, for high order microphones um, using different encoders. Sure. So the encoding technology, so we had this problem. Jens is not yet here. I don't want to play the eigenmic, but our sound engineers didn't want to with the first eigenmic. They have way better now. The, yeah. the first encoder, which was the third order encoder. So our sound engineers, which are used to high quality microphones, okay, yeah, cool. We do 3D audio recordings now. Use the eigenmic and said, no, no way. And I was saying, okay. <laughs> um, so we've been working together with sound engineers to get a good encoding function. So just working on the encoder, was good enough so we could find one solution which is good enough that they say, okay, no, it's a great microphone. Um, so that's very important, and I think Jens will talk about this as well. So there's a lot of, of knowledge in the encoding function. And also something which you have to apply, like the soft limiting. Um, so it's another parameter which normally you get when you encode, um, which you have to apply. Not for a first order, because first order doesn't have this strong bass boost, it comes with high orders. Um, I haven't been trying a lot of the different microphone arrays um, of first order. I'm not a very first order-ish person. Um, but for example, there are more advanced encoders than the first order, like Harpex, yeah. which does a spe spatial spectral analysis and then repanning, um, which gives you for the correlated, spatially correlated signals a, a, a higher order padding function. Um, so the encoding is something you should really try different encoders out and whatever. About the capsules, I think there is no difference in between because it's the same shape they are using, I guess, the MBO and whatever. It's more the, the quality of the capsule if you have tiny back electrodes or uh, bigger, bigger capsules. speaker coordinates, I could have them in a sphere this size or a sphere this size, and what the sphere is actually representing is what that, uh, what that sound field propagation is at that point along yes. the trajectory of the wave. Yes. Okay. Because you reduce it, actually, this is because in the original ambisonics formulation, you're not taking care about distance. Yeah. So it's all represented as plane waves. Which doesn't mean that you do not perceive distance because there are other distance cues, yeah. which are really important. And but it's all the curvature. But is, there, is there an issue with compensation for frequency fall off? And, and yeah, that's the issue when you use like a 32 channel like the Eigen mic. You cannot put them coincidentally in the center of the sphere. So you use a bigger sphere. Yeah. And that's the problem because then you have to divide by the spherical Bessel function. Right which gives you these ugly resonances. So it's better on a sound hard sphere. And there's a lot of research. So I work a lot with the Academy of Sciences in Vienna. So it's a group of mathematicians, which is also nice to outsource um, the brain work. Um, um, on stabilizing um, or getting rid of these resonances. And you can show when you use an open microphone array and you put some microphones inside the sphere, and some is really three, four, five, you get rid of all these artifacts. But you need an open sphere, which is difficult to construct and whatever, so it's, it's other engineering problems. But that's still ongoing research, how um, with the number of microphones we have, because we, we should have as, so we don't have, no, we want to have the lowest number of microphones possible for the highest frequency range. So the target would be to record 20 kilohertz with the lowest number of microphones without getting any spatial aliasing and whatever. And 
that's a little bit the problem. But there's a lot of research currently going on in, in, in this direction. Um, OK, that's the first order microphone array. Um, here you see Michael Gerson uh, with the first order microphone arrays. And um, so this is the Eigen mic, which Gary will show. I, I hope he will bring the new version as far as I understand. How much does it cost? Um, How much does it cost? Uh, you have to ask him, but I think it's about 15 grand. Thousand. Yeah. So you get 32 capsules for, it's 500 capsules, it's okay. Um, <laughs> it's really a beautiful thing of engineering. So it's self-powered, you just put an ethernet cable in. In terms of audio engineering, it's really great. So if you ever try to build your own spheres, like I did and somehow fade, they look like this and they are ugly and difficult to set up. And, um, they provide more capsules, but I guess Jens will maybe, they've been working on 64 channel versions, the seven over the microphone, and I very much hope um, that they succeeded to build it and he can show it, so it would be great. That's a prototype we did with the Tohoku University in Sendai in northern Japan. It's a 128 channel version. We also had a 256 channel version, but that's little uh, MEMS microphones, which are directly plotted on, on, on the PCB board. They are great because they are small. They do not need a lot of power and you get a digital stream, so you get rid of all the ADC conversion, whatever, but they sound ugly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's great for measurements, but it's not really great for music recording yet because actually I'm testing them since a couple of years and each new brand which I get gets better and better. So they make a, a lot of progress. Anyway. What we said is what I said a couple of times. So it's n plus one squared, um, at least in 3D, when you have to play back. And in 2D, you can also say you have 2D ambisonics. You're not using spherical any, uh, harmonics anymore. They're called circular ham uh, harmonics or cylindrical harmonics, to say it correctly. Then it's just 2n plus one. So if you use a ring of speakers, then you just lead 2n plus one. So a 20 order signal would be 41 speakers. That's okay in a circle. So 41 speakers on a stand gives you quite high order reproduction of ambisonics in the horizontal plane. Okay, um, so let's listen to some music. What's interesting with ambisonics is actually um, in terms of music and art, when you record with an ambisonics microphone array, which gives you a certain perspective. So just imagine that um, I record here whatever, that's a percussion. There's a hi-hat and I take my first order microphone or whatever order microphone and put it below the hi-hat. So the reproduction will be a huge hi-hat over the sphere. The far I get away, the more point source it becomes. So you could actually, you could just point it like this and go back and forth and what would happen in the reproduction is like a function which blurs up and goes back and blurs up and goes back. So this play with perspective in 3D audio recordings is really important. And to show you an example, um, which is very beautiful. So Natasha Barrett, um, she's a composer. She's working with ambisonics since I know her, so more than 15 years, um, with first order recordings and doing some kind of sound mosaicing, sound collage, however you want to name it. I'm not very good in naming this, but she's doing great music with ambisonics. And she was working on a piece and a very simple idea. She created her sound material, just taking a balloon, sticking a 3D microphone array in there, take a text board marker and just draw your trajectories on the balloon. And then apply some sound transformations and I'll show you how this sound likes, how this sounds like. That's a simple marker on the sphere. So now just imagine you want to do this with a panning function, that it sounds as naturally. That's a pain. Um, okay, so then you add some reverberation. 
Now it sounds like this. And then, of course, you can add some, I think, this example is pitch shifting, yeah. Do some pitch shifting. Let me see. Oh, that's not the example I was searching for. Then you can do some time stretching. And so you can create your sound material for writing a piece. And so I play a short excerpt of a piece, Topology Chamber, which you will quickly recognize the sound material she was using. So that's what you can do with a balloon and the microphone array. Uh, I think it's not too bad, no? So yesterday the question appeared about sound source directivity. So sound source directivity is something which is really important because we all know that um, the sound at your position in the auditorium is formed by the directivity of my voice. 
and the response of the room. So if I make my voice more directive, I do not lower the amplitude I'm talking, and I'm talking turning away from you, the timbre you perceive is completely different than what you perceive when I'm pointing towards you. So as you can imagine, classical instruments are rather difficult, so they radiate in different frequency ranges in different directions and whatever. So there was this very nice paper of Weinreich in the 80s um, who proposed to measure the radiation characteristic around an instrument by rotating two microphones um, on, on the, the radius around the, mic, uh, around the instrument. So you measure the sound pressure and the sound velocity on a sphere surrounding um, the instrument. What a surprise, you measure sound pressure on a sphere, so you apply spherical harmonics to get a description of um, the microphone, uh, of the directivity of your sound source. You use the velocity is not necessary if you can measure in an anechoic chamber because you only need the velocity, so two microphones that you know if the sound wave is outgoing or incoming. In an anechoic chamber, there is no incoming sound. It's all outgoing, so you can measure with one pressure microphone. So that's what you're doing, and then you decompose into spherical harmonics, the same which we did with ambisonics. It's exactly the same what you do with a microphone array where you measure the outside world on a microphone array, so now here you measure the inside world. So it's the same functions being involved, you have the same problems with regularization, and so on. So normally when we measure such things, um, like here it's for a saxophone, that's uh, 24 channels, uh, microphones on a robotic arm. You have a kind of acoustic exciter for the saxophone, then you do the different fingerings, and then you have students spending all the time in the anechoic chamber. <laughs> to measure uh, about 2,000 up to 3,000 points around the instrument. Um, the problem is, if you want to study voice, a singer will not reproduce what he was singing or she was singing before, um, so you need an array of microphones. Unfortunately, you cannot go that high um, so to have 2,800 microphones in an anchor chamber, which should by no way introduce any reflections. Mm? Uh, difficult to solve. So that's um, the Institute of Technical Acoustics of the University in Aachen in Germany, a 64 channel sphere. That's the University of Graz in Austria. There's another one in Southampton. They also have 64 channels as far as I know. Montreal. In Montreal they have also one yet. Um, so what you do is you measure the space-time frequency distribution on the sphere, then you can apply some partial tracking on your instrumental sound, and for each partial you attach actually the a sound field you have. So this would be the saxophone we've been measuring. So this is the fundamental frequency, and when the fundamental frequency shifts, you can see that the saxophone uh, varies in the radiation characteristics. So this just to say we know how to analyze in a very high spatial position over space, time, and frequency the radiation characteristics of an instrument. No. Video not playing, sorry. Um, but you can imagine, it's just in a 64 channel sphere, somebody's singing, you measure the sound pressure around this person. So to reproduce, okay, you've been measuring on the sphere, so you can build a spherical loudspeaker array. So that's spherical loudspeaker arrays. The first one, a cube, is nearby a sphere. Uh, <laughs> so actually, you can say that this loudspeaker is on a perfect sphere, it's the platonic solids. Um, so this was in 1980, it's Latime at IRCAM, um, where they did first tests and compositions with directive loudspeakers. And then you have many, you have from Princeton to Stanford to, you know, you can have 20 slides, I guess, with different speakers. Um, the recent ones are that one of the Institute of Electronic Music in Graz. It's an ecosahedron, and that's the one of Senmed, which was built together with Maya Sound, which provides 128 channels or whatever. So that's the Slork or Plork, um, so the Stanford Laptop Orchestra, Princeton Laptop Orchestra, so you've been, I guess, working on those. Those are, as far as I know, omnidirectional. So it would be nice Seriously. to individually address the channel and to add some directivity. The new, the new ones, which are solid aluminum, have six channel address. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, with a multi -channel. Because it's even, you don't have to always think about directivity of steering something. Just try omnidirectional dipole, omnidirectional dipole. 
on stage. With the dipole, you only hear reflections from stage. So the sound from stage disappears. And when I get omnidirectional, you send to all the audience. So just swapping in those functions, it's very different from, from just reducing the gain. Because you hear the room, um, so it, you reduce the presence of the source in the room. So it, it's very nice. There was a PhD um, at the University of, um, of Music in, in, in Graz, so Gary Charma, uh, who did his PhD on, as a composer on working with um, the ecocellular loudspeaker. It's a very interesting work if you want to get to it from a composer's point of view. Also a lot of perceptual work together with um, a psychoacoustician and Franz Sotte is doing signal processing and acoustics. So they had five years, I guess, on the project. Uh, the project's name was, maybe it will come back to my mind. Anyway. What are those speakers used for normally? Um, like you can use them for measurements. Oh, come on. So um, I'll show you in a second. So that's a measurement speaker um, where you measure room impulse responses with directivity. Um, but I'll come to this in a second. Yes, please. Um, what was the composer's name? Garriott Charma. Okay. And the project was OSIL, O-S-I-L. Don't ask me what it stands for. Um, so it was at the Institute of Electronic Music of the University of Music and Performing Arts in Graz, Austria. And you'll find his PhD. Um, it's, it's a beautiful work. OK. You also can reproduce because we express the directivity in terms of spherical harmonics. So you can use wave fit synthesis to reproduce directivity by not only getting the driving functions for a monopole, but also for a dipole, for a quadrupole, and whatever. So you get here, oops, come on, a dipole, a quadrupole, a monopole, and a dipole. And then you compute the functions for each speaker for this fundamental uh, for this basis function. And then you get just the weighting coefficients which describe for each frequency the directivity of your source. So you could stream a monophonic stream, then you get the partial tracking from the measurement which I showed you, then you apply the spheric harmonics coefficients to recreate the directivity. Since you have the fundamental, the base functions here implemented in the system, you can recreate the directivity of um, the instrument. So we had one performance which was fun in, back in 2010. So they measured in the sphere at the University of Graz, not measured, it was a live performance. So we had the soloist player in Graz and um, he was projected on the, in the concert hall of IRCAM by using a wave feed synthesis array. Um, live over internet, 64 channel full band with audio stream from Austria to IRCAM in real time. And so he was playing there a solo piece, and we had a hologram or holophone of him on stage. And then, of course, it was trombone, so he was asked to turn a lot ahead that we can show what we can do. Um, and it worked quite properly. So you have the feeling that there is an instrument which is turning around, and it's the radiation characteristics of the instrument playing in the little sphere of microphones. The only thing is, OK, you have one solo instrument playing in Graz and then on stage virtually in, in Paris. And you have at least eight IT guys on each side uh, making sure that the internet connection works full bandwidth without clicks and crackles. You don't always need to um, use a spherical loudspeaker array. You can reproduce sound source directivity in ambisonics or as well with wave feed synthesis, but limited to the horizontal plane. So you get a slice of the directivity. You don't get the full directivity. And then it's not true because I'm not only, that's what we discussed yesterday, playing out in the horizontal plane, but I play out in different directions. So the response is not the same. So you get a more lobe, which is panned like this. But when you reproduce a directive instrument like trombone, so you get a kind of lobe, and when he's turning the head in the sphere, you scan the room or you um, send the sound uh, to the different directions in the room, which is really beautiful. Okay. Um, very quickly, the reverberation. Um, I like this. Um, so Renzo Piano was once saying, you feel that your life is being lost in a room where sound dies. We need reverberation. Um, 
I like this because it's definitely true. All your, our distance perception and all these things are linked to reverberation and room. So just very quickly, we have different kinds of room simulation. So the one hand is we can make a room acoustic model and do some beam tracing, ray tracing, whatever, um, to get a three-dimensional room impulse response. Or we can measure a room impulse response and then apply it in convolution, reverb, for example, to um, get the reverberation well done. Or we can analyze it and get some feedback delay networks doing the same than the room impulse response would do, which is mostly often more efficient than a convolution with 25 channels of uh, six seconds of room impulse response or whatever. Or what was done, which is called the SPAT model um, in the 80s, there was a huge series of perceptual tests at IRCAM, uh, which they created the perceptual model, which is implemented in SPAT to fake your perception that you get a distance perception, which is easy to use. So feedback delay networks, that's a standard model. You just feedback channels with some damping coefficients, so delay lines, damping coefficients, decay, and so on, to create a very dense network of late reverberation. So what's happening, it's like a sound is coming into a room, bounces off a wall, gets damped, frequency filtered at the wall before it's bounced back into the room, gets to the next wall, it's get denser and denser, and the feedback delay network, it is, was proposed by Jean-Marc Schott and, and Shen, simulates this effect. So that's what we call, what you have in all these reverberation uh, processes. Another form is convolution. So you measure the room impulse response, and when you measure the room impulse response, you can apply it as a filter, and then you hear it as in the room. So normally, we've been measuring room impulse responses with an omnidirection microphone. So you get the energy distribution over time. So it sounds like in your room, but you have no information on direction. If you now replace your omnidirection microphone array by a spherical microphone array, then you get also the directions, which we call the um, DRIR, or direction room impulse responses, which are quite nice because let's say you measure with an eigen mic, you get a fourth order signal, 25 channels, then you have to apply a convolution. So you encode it into ambisonics. Let's say you have three seconds room impulse response, then you need a real-time convolution, 25 times three seconds room impulse responses. And what you get out of your convolution reverb is the ambisonics, the, the reverberated ambisonic stream of your signal. It sounds really beautiful because you get a three-dimensional acoustic picture of your room. What you're not doing is we cannot represent when you measure with an omnidirection sound source, it's the same. You have an omnidirection sound source in the room, so you don't have any information on directivity of the sound source. So we replace the microphone, the omnidirection microphone, by a spherical microphone array or whatever microphone array, and now we replace the sphere by a spherical loudspeaker array. So what you normally do is you send, you measure, or you excite the room with loudspeakers on a sphere, Normally we do it with about 600 points, so we have a rotational um, speaker array. The problem is this three-dimensional, or we call it MIMO, multiple input, multiple output room impulse responses is, instead of having a single six seconds signal in a church, so six, six seconds of room impulse response, with an eigen mic you get 30 times, or if you encode it in ambisonics, 25 times six seconds. And the MIMO room impulse response is normally a matrix of 600 points of excitation to 64 channels of microphones times six seconds. And then you have, go, uh, have to go to the next building there. There's the supercomputer of RPI. Mm -hmm. And you better render this offline. So we are far off doing this um, um, online. But it's really beautiful because when you have this MIMO room impulse response, you can use your measured coefficients of an instrument and you hear the directive instrument as being played in the room. So that's so far the highest resolution we can do in room acoustic measurements. It's some gigabytes of data which you have to convolve and whatever, but some institutions have supercomputers, so um, you can do it. Okay. So, Yeah, no, yeah. so we have, for example, a 64 channel microphone array, which captures 64 channels each time. Yeah. Unfortunately, it cannot play um, 64 channels 
on a loudspeaker um, in a row because they have a certain dimension, so I don't have enough um, uh, loudspeakers on a sphere, so I have to rotate it. Mm -hmm. But what I do virtually is to have a, around 600 excitation points, which you need for high resolution directivity rendering on a sphere. Yes. So, so for. Yeah, I capture sequentially. And then, so for each excitation signals, you get 64 reception signals. So you get 64 room impulse responses for this loudspeaker on this position on the sphere. And this you do 600 times. Yes. So of course, the higher you get in resolution, the better it is. Yes. Um, and then you get a huge matrix, which is 640 times 64 times 6 seconds. Yes. And that's your room impulse response, which you have to convolve with the signal. And then, so first you encode everything into ambisonics, and then you apply the spherical harmonics coefficients for the directivity, and on the other side you apply it in convolution then for getting the ambisonic signal out. And then get, you, you get an ambisonics representation of a directional instrument being played in the room you've been measured. And then you go out to the coffee wall. Yes. But. Yeah, we just, it's always the same. The picture. For reverb, for directivity. Yes, exactly. Hmm? Like, uh, apart from reverb and directivity, can you apply those impulse responses in something else? Yes, what you can do is you go to time space frequency domain, and then, <coughs> so it sounds easy to do time space frequency. Uh, so we know a lot of time frequency processing. Then you, you add a dim dimension, so it's not tricky. But unfortunately, it's not the case. So you go into time space frequency domain, and then you can, for example, just imagine that you work in the studio, <coughs> you listen to a 3D reverberation, and you have a ground floor, floor reflection from your measured room, which is really annoying. Cancel it. Take your virtual rubber and get rid of it. And then you resynthesize the room impulse response, and then you do it. Doing convolution reverb means if you've ever done, um, so I quickly played in some examples from uh, work I did with Olga Neuwirth, where we measured the Chiesa San Lorenzo, where Prometheus was played in, in Venice, um, just in direction room and bus responses. But when you apply a seven second, 25 channel, fourth order ambisonics convolution reverb in real time, it eats up one CPU of a little Mac Pro black tower. So, then you would have to do this for each direction. You had to have the sound because it's direction dependent. So very quickly, so we had six ensembles sitting in six different directions. Um, and all the ensemble members could be in the artificial reverberation convolution. So I would have to use one Mac Pro just for the convolution. So convolution is a quite expensive um, thing. But it sounds really beautiful. And so, for example, one example, um, so what you hear here, or what you will hear here, is we've been recording with an eigen mic in the church, so I don't say which instrument or singer has been recorded. So you hear trombone, countertenor, soprano. Some of them been recorded in the church, some takes taken in a studio and then convoluted afterwards, and you hear an ambisonics playback of the whole thing. And when you listen to the trombone, you can hear this late reverberation movement, which is very particular in the church of, of uh, in the case of San Lorenzo. So let's give it a try.
I stop here. Okay, so this just gives you an impression what you can do with convolution reverb. So, soprano in church or not? The soprano recorded in the church or convolution reverb? So, soprano was studio. Um, parts of the countertenor in the, no, parts of soprano in the church, most of the soprano in the studio, countertenor and tile in the studio, and half of the trombones in the studio and half of the trombones in the church. <laughs> um, and you can't hear the difference. The only thing is you have to, it's a little bit more tricky than just measuring. You have to denoise the direction of room and pulse responses in time, space, frequency domain and whatever. You know, but we have to do something in research sometimes. Um, that's okay. Um, maybe very quickly, because I think we are at the end of this session. I was not really talking about the perceptual model of SPAT, but I think it's a very effective and, 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 and also beautiful um, model. So I'm just quickly playing. I have a question. Yeah, sure. Um, is the studio in anechoic chambers? The studio is nearby anechoic, yeah. Okay. So not anechoic, but a very dry studio. Uh, we didn't record in the anechoic chamber because actually what's happening when you record singers in an anechoic chamber, um, it's not very fresh air and they feel very uncomfortable. Um, so the music, in terms of music, the performance you get out of singer or instrument play in an ambisonic, uh, in an anechoic chamber doesn't match with a somehow lively studio. Um, so that's why we s decided to make a closed microphone uh, or multiple microphones to get nice timber that you can decide in, in post-production. But actually what we did is, this was just part, um, that's just a mix which is played the interlude in the middle of the concert. So it's a huge concert, it's a 90 minutes concert, no, 70 minutes concert. So you have six ensemble groups. So you can see it here, um, you have six ensemble groups. So we've been playing this ensemble, ensemble under contemporary. On, so director was Matthias Pincher. So you, here you see the electronics. So six groups surrounding the audience, and you could always decide who is playing in the virtual room and not. So you have actually per group uh, artificial reverberation in convolution reverb, and you have closed microphones to each of the ensemble members and following this core. So it's a huge play with the real room or acoustics, real acoustics of the concert hall and the virtual acoustics, mm -hmm. and a lot of electronics going on. Um, so it's a beautiful piece. Which yeah, works quite well. Yes. Now it's here. It's going a little bit. So I will quickly mute the guitars. And so it's clear, so we have three sources, and of course we can move them around in real time. That's something we know. Um, and then there is something which we call the perception model of SPAT, which tweaks actually the virtual room impulse response in three temporal sections and three frequency sections, which is linked to perception model just to simulate the effect that the sound source gets far away or comes closer. It's not only the direct to reverb ratio, it's going a little bit beyond in, in three frequency bands and three temporal sections. And what's nice about this model is when I go far away and then normally he stops singing and then I turn the source around. and I make it more directive. So he's singing away from us. And he's singing back to us. So pointing towards us, going away. I make him omnidirectional and I bring him back. So in terms of CPU power, this is very effective. So if you don't have particular requests on a room, um, it's unnecessary to use convolution reverb. You can do a lot with artificial reverb, with feedback delay networks and so on. 
if you have some particular early refractions models you want to have, or um, there's an open source project which, uh, which I started in 2007. It's not developing very fast because it's a spare time project and um, yeah, the problem of spare time. Um, so it's a ray tracing or beam tracing model uh, which works in nearby real time. So when you, I have currently a student, she wants to work on rooms which have moving walls. So you virtually put your sound in the room and then the room starts moving around, uh, which is quite beautiful. Um, so then you use ray tracing, beam tracing, and whatever room simulation. But when you have a particular room, like um, Olga wanted to work, so she, we had coffee together in Vienna, and she was saying, hey, I, I really want to get to this church because she saw Prometheus life there. Um, I'm jealous. Um, and this was a huge influence for her to work on, as a composer in spatial audio. And she wanted to capture this room, and she was living in Venice, and she was walking by this church very often. And oh, the, we saw the picture yesterday. You know, you have to speak holes in there, and normally you're not allowed to go there anymore. More, so it took us three years to get access because it's Italian administration. It was <laughs> given to Mexico, so we had to deal with Mexican and Italian administration. Um, but finally, we found our way in there, and it's 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 really beautiful in terms of acoustics. It's a very very beautiful space. And so what I was doing is I had three different microphone positions here in this room, um, here somewhere, so this position here, and then in the second room. And I only had the chance, I had two days in there, so I, I didn't bother with um, directional speakers, so spherical speakers. That's an omnidirection speakers, and I've been measuring, can't remember, but about 80 positions per room um, to get a fine grid, at least that we conserve these beautiful acoustics. Um, with speaker positions here and then, of course, in the other room. So that what was happening here, and then instrumental recordings as well. Okay, but that's it's so three-dimensional room impulse response is really beautiful. We had uh, an artistic project of Augustin Müller and Pedro Valesquez. So they've been traveling half of Europe just measuring 3D room impulse responses. And we hope that if all the partners agree, we hope that we can make them available online, that you can play around with them, um, because it's very beautiful, it's fourth order ambisonics, and it adds something particular. Um, and then, of course, you can start working with them. So we recently made an anal analysis tool, which is not fully automatic yet. So you drag and drop your 3D room parts in, and then you get the coefficients for a feedback delay network out, which simulates the room and pulse response so that you keep only the early reflection part in convolution, and the late reverberation is replaced by a feedback delay network, which is, in terms of computational power, way more efficient. But we cannot simulate something like in the case of San Lorenzo, where the sound moves around in late reverberation, because this doesn't, just doesn't work with a feedback delay network. OK, so this was a very quick continuation of, restart, of what we started yesterday. So if you have any questions. So when you measure uh, impulse responses, and yeah, you use an omnidirectional speaker, mm -hmm. right? and, but where did you put the omnidirectional speaker? Because uh, yeah, you have a speaker, and you also have a, a, a microphone. Yeah, so the speaker on the microphone, I had three <coughs> microphone positions, three different microphone positions, and then I sampled the room with the speaker. So I moved the speaker around the microphone. So I was measuring per room about 80 positions of, because the problem is the room impulse, with the three dimensional room impulse response is, it adds direction. So it knows where the direct sound comes from. So when I measure my room impulse response with the speaker here and I do convolution with my voice, I would speak from here. Yeah. If I measure with the speaker on the plate over there, my voice would come from there. Because the direct sound has a direction now. <coughs> if you do an omnidirectional microphone, you, you don't have this problem. Mm -hmm. But here you have this problem because with the omnidirectional microphone, the early reflection patterns change. Okay, it changes the room and pulse response. But with a directional microphone uh, array, it's essential when you move the speaker in your auditory image, the sound will move with the speaker. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, when you then have to then you can extract only the late part of the reverberation. You can simulate early reflections that you only use the late part in convolutions. You fake the early reflections that you can move the sound source around because otherwise you would need a fine grid of measured room impulse responses and pan in between them. Mm -hmm. 
If I would like to add elevation, I would have to fly a speaker. Yeah. Um, so this would then be the drone version of um, <laughs> of Borum, the silent drone version. So balloon, balloon yeah, um, stable in space. Um, so normally you sample some kind of spatial sampling. That's what what, what we do. Okay. Because I was thinking about if you fix the the source, the omnidirectional speaker, and then you move uh, like your microphone, and then. Yeah, then, 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 the, then the problem is um, the microphone represents the listener. Because yes. what you get is mm -hmm. when I add an omnidirection, no, a, a directional speaker array, then I could deal with the problem because then I could inverse the functions because you can ex uh, replace sender, uh, so swap sender and receiver mm -hmm. if they have the same properties. But since I've been using an omnidirectional speaker, you would be at the. so. The difference is you would be walking around the speaker in the room, and otherwise the speaker is walking around you in the room. So it's not the same acoustical patterns which you measure. In terms of yes. Thank you. With regard to the agamic, is it that it gets such large impulses at low frequencies because all the cartridges are seeing the same low frequency? There's no directivity. So uh, there is a kind of directivity, but in low frequencies you don't have the problem because the sphere is that big. But it's higher frequencies. In higher frequency to get some directivity, yes. But knowing that fourth order ambisonics um, also doesn't represent the very high frequencies very well. Um, so it's a compromise. Um, so I've been measuring with some prototypes up to 512 microphones. Um, then you run into other troubles. Um, but of course, we would like to have a very high resolution bell sounding microphone array, but we are still far, it's an engineering problem. So we have the mathematical solutions, but we, ideally, I want to have the smallest sphere possible with the highest number of microphones. That's always a trade off. But I, as I was saying, I hope that, that Jens, when he comes, can, can show us the new version of the Eigen mic, because I, I want to see it. At least I want to record with it. Um, so if you see me walking, I will not attend the workshop the next three days when he's here. I will just walk around Troy with the microphone. Um, could happen. Um, yes, please. Yeah, so I just wanted to ask something about the encoding and basically mm -hmm. making music for um, Sonic. The piece you play, the woman drawing around the bullet. Mm -hmm. So she had a recording. Of, that was her uh, palette. She, she, she had a, a, a microphone inside right, the right, room. Right. Yeah. She made this recording. Mm -hmm. And then, so if you're, and then that was encoded for. For ambisonics, yes. So if you're starting, so she's starting from a real source, and you're talking about using microphones to capture real world events that happen over the air. Mm -hmm. So if you're making music which is uh, in the box, say, mm -hmm. um, and you're making purely electronic music, which is not recorded. Is it a whole other process? No, not uh, a whole other process. Okay. So it, ac actually, you find a lot of tools like plugins, which, which allows you to encode, for example, in ambisonics. We've been always going a little slightly different approach. So we have um, our, our 3D audio mixer. So it's this mixer here. Uh, which very easy lets you, for example, I want to work with an eigen mic, so I make a track, I say, okay, this track is an eigen mic. Um, it's using 25 channels, which defines a fourth order encoder, mm -hmm. um, and I call it eigen mic. So, hello, here we are. Um, then I say, oops, no, that's the group. Then I say, I make a bus, which is a fourth order ambisonics bus with 32 speakers, fourth order up. Then I would just feed in here my speaker positions from this room here, which I would just copy in. Then I would say the eigenmic encoder, which encoder I would use. So that's our encoder here. I would route it to the bus, and I would say it's an S in 3D. It uses in-phase MAXRE encoding with a decoding with 450 hertz crossover. I route the input signals of my sound card, I route the output signals to the master, oops. And here we are, you feed your stream in. And if you now want to add, for example, spot microphones or synthetically um, sound sources, I just make a mono track, mm -hmm. let's say mono, five, six tracks. That's pretty straight up routing. 
and then you just go route it to the bus and you get azimuth elevations right here. And then you can hook up um, so a plugin which Tibu, our developer is programming, which is called Tos Toscar, so which yeah. allows you to transform the OC messages. And what a surprise, Panoramics receives Toscar, so you just define which port you're listening to, and you get azimuth elevation distance, and then you have your DAW. On, on one computer running, you stream the audio channels, you get the information, and you pan around, and that's it. Okay. And then you can, of course, just go here and have EQs and all the things you need. But normally the idea was this is a spatial audio mixer. So you should do all the mixing part in your digital audio workstation, mm -hmm. because why should we reprogram a digital yeah. audio workstation? They're there, and they are well done. Yeah. Um, so here we just added EQs because our sound engineers start using this tool a lot for life. So they wanted to have some features like compressor, EQ, and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but this is mainly only spatial parameters yeah. which you get. And so this perceptual model in there, you can add reverberation. So you can see here, that for example, the ambisonics bus gets a reverberation. Here in this reverberation bus, um, yeah, so you have the reverberation time and, and, and some parameters. Um, which are quite quite nice and you get a full 3D reverberation in yeah. space and it's very easy so you can use spot for example it's max and speed patch but it needs you need you have to patch yeah and not so many people like patching and so this was something hybrid in between patching and providing something for our sound engineers that they can work in their way of working yeah. their workflow got it that's really so, straightforward and as I was saying, this tool is free for Linux and very not very expensive for all the other platforms. Uh -huh. Do you have to buy a Mac? No, send alone. Great. You don't need Macs for running panoramics. And recently, or very recently, um, which is quite beautiful, for all people sitting in this room, um, you can use a bus. And this bus goes way fit synthesis. You say you have a 64 wow. channel array, you can go beyond 64 channels and then you get a wave feed synthesis. The only thing is you need a little object to compute the filter set, which you then load in there. Sure. You can go binaural, so I can say here, um, show monitoring. And then I say I monitor my ambisonics bus. Oops. The only thing we need big is video screens. Um, and then here somewhere, where is my monitoring? Um, view, sorry, once again, show view monitoring. Here we are. So I get my monitoring here, I can load, because we have, I standardized with, with a friend of mine, we could convince AES to standardize an exchange format for head-related transfer functions, which is called AES69, or SOFA. And so this would now connect to the server of ECAM, which provides for free hundreds of, of uh, measured so um, head-related transfer functions. So I could download my transfer function here. And then I have a virtual speaker approach, which virtualizes my ambisonics channels into binaural. So I can monitor at home. Your binaural monitoring. Yes, wow. because that's what I normally do. I travel a lot, and then I go to a concert, and. Of course, everything is always well prepared, it's way advanced the concert, so I can sleep in the train or in the plane. Uh, I'm never ending up with headphones um, sitting somewhere. You have a sensor for the HRTS? Yes. And it's a separate sensor? Or it comes on your headphones? Um, it's a separate. Okay. So it's a, just a small tracker which, is, uh, which works on Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Um, but normally, I even don't bother with head tracking. You just move around? So how do you actually point the sort? Um, I'm working long enough in this that, you know, sure. it's, it's, I think, a little bit like a composer. He doesn't need the symphony orchestra to write for a symphony orchestra. And of course, I do not the refinement for a concert in movements. Like but I, I, I just check things. It's the, if they're globally working, and this saves you a lot of time when you then come to the concert hall, you know at least the rough work is done, and then you do the refinement, and that's OK. And this is. Actually, I was patching all my life, uh, all my professional life, but I start to use this very often because I'm getting lazy. Um, <laughs> but of course, there are many things which, you not, which are not possible with a mixing device like this. So you very quickly come also to the yeah. point where you want to use convolution <coughs> reverb or whatever, which we will maybe integrate, but then you can patch around. 
But the nice thing is, um, what I very often doing, it also comes with spot. So it's an object in spot as well. So you can use it, you can patch around this. And if I now want to use convolution reverb, I would just add convolution reverb and then encode it, yeah. um, which is quite, quite nice. So, but there are many other tools. I don't want to, I'm not a PR person. Uh, can you apply the transfer functions here? You don't have to buy them there for free. I mean, apply the transfer yeah. functions for the impulse response using spot. No, not here. I would but need... I used to use cool edit 20 years ago. It was really nice. No, I would, what I would do is just to apply this, but 5.rt. No, it's not. just con convert. So convolution or convert, which is a 3D. So it's a, a multi-channel convolution. Okay. And it's a zero delay convolution. So I don't know if you know the algorithm by Gardner, which yeah. became very famous. So it's a serial delay convolution, which goes a little bit beyond what Gardner was doing. We're not doing the same. And it's quite efficient in terms of CPU power, um, as long as you can. There? Hmm? And can you apply yeah, the sure. there so you can choose your impulse? Or? I could do an ambisonics convolution reverb. For, for the electronic musicians, that's basically what I do. I never use reverbs. I work yeah, yeah, whatever is pulse, whatever yeah. convolution you want to do. The nice thing about the spot objects are that they're always multi-channel. Okay. So, and it's easy to set up multi-channel because you just say add channels 25 and you get 25 convolution channels. Cool. And you can load multi-channel impulses, whatever. Mm -hmm. Multi-channel is fun. Yeah. Okay. And uh, for those of you who work, but the Brahma will show this to you, but you know, you can imagine, so, as here, we work with very many channels. Um, Rama was so nice and so sweet to us to develop this object, which is called multi-connect. <laughs> hey, you came in the right, right moment, and I just so push <laughs> exclamation, exclamation mark, and hello! Yeah. Another hour of my life is saved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought exclamation mark would be the right short. Yeah, you, you, you come in the perfect moment, actually. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I hand over to Rama, which now shows you, or will show you how to patch, how to use spot in, in with Max MSP. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll see each other tomorrow's concert today. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.